My name is Susie F. Garcia. I will be the interviewer, and today is the 29th of October, 2015. We are located in the Julian Samora Library at the campus of the University of Notre Dame at South Bend, Indiana. And I will be interviewing Carmen Jimenez-Smith, author of the poetry collections, The City She Was In, Goodbye Flicker, National Poet National Book Critic Circle Award finalist, Milk and Felt, Memoir, Bring Down the Little Birds, and Three Chat Books. She's an associate professor in the MFA program at New Mexico State University, publisher of Noemi Press, and editor-in-chief of Puerto del Sol. I would like to thank you for being here and being part of our oral history project at the Institute of Latino Studies in the University of Notre Dame. Thank you. For the purposes of documentation, could you please tell us your full name, date, and place of birth, and where you are living today? My full name is Carmen Elizabeth Jimenez Smith. Um, what was my birthday? <laughs> yeah, yeah. February 20th, 1971. Uh, my birthplace, New York, New York. New York, New York. And you're now in New York, Mexico. Now I, now I live in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Okay, yeah. great. So um, I kind of want to start at the beginning, <laughs> where it all starts, um, and talk a little bit about your childhood. I read your memoir, which was fantastic, um, but it was such a, a fantastically specific memoir about motherhood and art and the intersections. So can you tell us a little bit about your childhood growing up more generally? Sure. Um, my parents, well, my parents, my mom came here for vacation when she was like 21, 22 and they were in California, they were doing like the, what I guess the, they did in the 18th century when they did the continent, when she was doing this continent, the, the, this part of the continent. And my, my dad, who was like 19, uh, came up and, and they ended up staying here and getting married. And um, he was in the restaurant business and, um, and kind of, he's a kind of restless person. So we moved a lot, we moved like, 13 times by the time I was in um, middle school. But then at a certain point, my mom and dad divorced and we got, ended up staying in California. I'm primarily a Californian. I grew up in California. I went to San Jose State um, where I studied with um, Virginia de Rougeau, who was um, a fantastic teacher, Alden Nielsen, who is a great scholar and he was my very first teacher and he like gave me Harry Matthews and William Carlos Williams mm -hmm. and Wanda Wanda Coleman um, and Alan Soldovsky who really is um, was a central m mentor to me he taught a class called the critical writing of poetry 90a which I remember I still have the book I use the book I um, and retrospectively I realized that he taught me how to do close reading like nobody's business. But he was also in charge of the Center for Literary Arts. So um, one day he asks, does anybody want to volunteer? We have readings. And that was the beginning of my career, I guess, as a, as a literary person, as a literary activist. I folded, <laughs> I folded programs, I drove people around, I set up chairs, I, you know, I did all, everything that you do. I learned, and just indirectly, I learned a lot. Um, it, he was a very busy, distracted man, much like me. <laughs> and so um, <clears throat> I was on my own a lot of the time doing, doing things. Um, and I ended up meeting really fantastic writers and just luckily falling deeply into the world of writing. He introduced me to Juan Felipe Herrera, who was an important person for me to know um, when I was very young. Um, and after I graduated college, I um, applied to a couple of graduate schools. I got into Iowa. Um, I. I, before I went to Iowa, I went to Humboldt County because Juan Felipe was giving a performance. It was this weird, it was like, it was the mid-90s, people were optimistic. <laughs> so it was like this multi-art, you know, there were opera singers and drummers and performance poetry. And um, and so I did a performance, I did a performance with a, with a drummer and I and I sang Como Fue and I wrote this saying this whole thing about my mom and it was it was very liberating and then I went to Iowa and uh, studied there for two years I had um, 
Forrest Gander was, I mean, I, I had several mm -hmm. teachers, but he was the kindest and the most sort of enduring influence on me. Um, the person who made me feel that I could possibly keep doing poetry. Um, I, what else? Like growing up, I lived with my grandma. Mm -hmm. um, she was a little crazy, but beautiful and funny. And she spoke a bunch of languages. She, she, you know, she spoke Italian. She spoke French. She was her dad was British. She answered the phone. Yes. So she, you know. You mentioned in your memoir that your mother worked something like three jobs, but yeah. she would um, often still find time to do things like watch Hepburn films with you or um, she would tell, she had like these moments of creativity, like the idea that you and your brother were twins, just born several months apart. Yes. Um, how do you think that really influenced your aesthetic or your ideas of creativity? My mom, it, my mom is incredibly funny. Even in late stage Alzheimer's, she's hilarious. And she's always been tremendously funny. Uh, and I think that, um, in my family, it was just like be out funnying each other and entertaining each other and storytelling. And because we traveled so much, because we moved so much, you know, we were in a way a very insular family because, you know, we would meet people. My mom, I never saw my mom have a friend, you know, from the neighborhood or anything like that. <clears throat> she had work acquaintances and then if we happened to live somewhere where there was family, that was... So we were actually very, very kind, you know, that, that, that was who we were. And so we would take long drives and we would have to tell stories and she told amazing stories. And like, I have this vision of, of her youth in Peru. Um, but I think that her wit and just her, her ability to play with language and make jokes, I think that I learned a lot from her. And, and another part of it was uh, she would tell fairy tales, but then she would mix them up and make mm -hmm. them funny or make them subversive and and um, and I just didn't I realized that 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 was something that was possible. I was she you know my parents everybody in my family tells me that even when I was two years old I was trying to read like I would be sitting on the toilet with upside down <laughs> paper you know um, and I loved books I think um, you know, again, retrospectively, I can see that I saw English as some a code that I needed to break, mm -hmm. and I'm and I'm constantly approaching it that way. I constantly can see the way it's constructed. I I, um, I know that um, Rosa talked about being a child interpreter. I my my parents were very proactive about learning English, but not my grandma. So I was her translator, and there there were times that you know my parents needed my help and. Um, but for the most part, they were very active English speakers. My father only spoke to us in English um, so, because he was very intent on us becoming fluent. Mm -hmm. um, and I just was this insanely voracious reader. I read everything, most, mostly books that I got at the library or at garage sales, and it was completely indiscriminate. So it might be like a true crime novel about a serial killer or I read this whole series of hi uh, historical novels by a writer named John Jakes I don't even remember it like it had sex and like kind of history and <laughs> so it, like a, I, version of it, history. a version of history <laughs> like you know um, so I think I just um, I loved it I, I was just this sponge I loved words I loved thinking about words so often I would read and I wouldn't even know how to pronounce the words because nobody, you know, right. like adjective, for example, the first mm -hmm. time I read adjective, I was, I've, I've, I always thought it was adjective, which makes sense. Um, I think I had that issue with like sophisticated. Yeah. Where I just like, I don't, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, so that was really that, I mean, my, that all I did as a child was read and just, and watch movies, old movies with my grandma who'd say, oh, Cary Grant, and you know, <laughs> so, it, uh, like a lot of fantasy, a lot of fiction was part of my childhood, and I actually want, started wanting to be a fiction writer, but I ended up being a poet, I think in part because my mentors in college were all poets. Mm -hmm. So you spent a lot of your childhood absorbing. Yeah, I did, and listening, and paying attention, I, you know, like, I would get in trouble for like talking when the adults were talking. I just was always 
engaged in, uh, interested in discourse. Mm -hmm. So um, Milk and Filth is a little bit of a tribute to these kinds of influences, particularly the women influences in your life. Uh, if you could kind of speak to one that specifically kind of helped you meld into a writer, um, talk a little bit about how that influence affected your writing the most and maybe which person in Milk and Filth you kind of relate to most on a personal level. It can be the same person or several. Huh. Um, well, the I think that my mom had to work. There, I mean, there was just so, so I think that she was in the world and she had to work. And when I saw that she wasn't treated fairly because she was a woman of color or because she was a woman, it just didn't make sense to me. Like I, I, I simply couldn't understand it. Um, and so, uh, and and I was also, I guess, in in relation to like cultural tropes of Latin Amer Latin American and Latino families, I was a tomboy. Uh, so, um, I think that my mom not being afraid to go into the world and like I saw other women in other families of Latino families of like not learning English, not getting jobs. My mom did it. She was not afraid of anything and and even when she had setbacks, she just never, I never saw her give up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that was important um, for me. And then I think, re in well, Joan Rivers, <laughs> I remember, I, I, I loved watching Johnny Carson when I was a little girl. Um, and it tells you how good my bedtime was. That was, <laughs> that was a problem. But I remember seeing Joan Rivers for the first time. I mean, I loved Phyllis Diller too. I loved I, Lucille Ball. I loved female comedians. I was just entranced by them because they were doing this thing that you didn't see a lot of women do. Um, but Joan Rivers was, um, she reminded me of another writer that I read a lot when I was a little girl, and that was Irma Bombeck. I read everything that Irma Bombeck wrote. And, um, and that's another person uh, who, was, who was an influence because she was a feminist and mm -hmm. she laughed about her family. And there's a way in which there's a lot of um, Irma Bombeck in Bring Down the Little Birds. Um, but when I saw Joan Rivers and saw the transgression of her humor, and she was the first comedian, female comedian, that I remember seeing on the Johnny Carson show, mm -hmm. I was blown away. I was completely entranced with her and, um, and her delivery and her jokes were so funny to me. Um, and she, again, like my mother, she was unafraid. And I think that that was like seeing women who were unafraid was very, very important to me because, of course, it, you know, I was a child I, and my mom was, my mom was afraid of the world. It wasn't like, you know, she was like protective of us. Um, and she would say, oh, you know, go wear, wear your coat. Or like when I was in my 30s living in San Francisco, she'd call me and she'd say, I'm just so worried about you. You're living in this, and I'm, you know. Um, but that's because she was our mom. She was fierce in her love for us. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really think that um, it was just paying attention to Katherine Hepburn, of course, too, mm -hmm. like seeing her in movies, just again, wearing trousers and not caring and, and just taking control. I just, that was what I was attracted to. And that, those, were the, those were the models that I was looking at um, of who I wanted to be. And then I, then I would seek that out more. I would say, okay, well, you know, eventually after, you know, as I got older and I would hear names, like I would hear, uh, you know, Gloria Steinem, I'd be like, okay, that's somebody I have to read because people keep talking about her. Ms. Magazine, that's something. So I just kind of, the way you discover music, mm -hmm. I just kind of discovered these different avenues into feminism. And then, then in college, it was such an, it, it was the, early, early 90s, that was kind of a really exciting time for women's studies because that's when there were, all of the women's studies were flourishing in the, in the country. And I was, and so I just had this really amazing women's studies teacher and she was completely, again, unafraid. She talked very frankly about her personal life. I remember <clears throat> it was during the Loma Prieta um, earthquake, which was that terrible earthquake in um, 1989. And she said, 
I was using my vibrator when, <laughs> when the, you know, and I was like, what? Um, I, what's a vibrator? Um, <laughs> so it was just, um, it just, I just feel like I hit a really magical time, a really optimistic time for feminism, and, and I bought into it. Um, mm-hmm. And so that, so I was, you know, I was in it for life. That was, you know, um, everything I did was related. I read a lot of women. I was very conscientious about reading a lot of women poets. Um, and my teacher, again, Alan and Virginia and Alden, were very good about pointing me to people of color and I mean the 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 few that they knew but Alden specialized in black poetry so I mean that was awesome Mm -hmm. um and and I just again sponge 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 I was I was in a way a terrible student um I like to go out dancing um I did great in all my English classes barely passed every other class in college. I think we, we know those feelings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, um, I, um, I have an, a disability, a, a, a learning disability, it's called dyscalculia, and um, I kept failing math, and finally I was able to get like a dispensation, mm-hmm. and I ended up finishing my undergraduate degree at Iowa, taking a speech class that would qualify for my math class. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, so. Um, I've only recently learned about that disability. Yeah. But it, it seems like it might be more prevalent than we want to diagnose. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, like, it makes sense. Particularly in women who are yeah. told so often that they're bad at math. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's not, and it's not just math, it's spatial stuff, mm-hmm. like, you know, my mom b- would sometimes put me in dance classes and I would be, I don't know, left, right, mm-hmm. you're going, it looks like you're going this way, I don't know, you know, it was like a different language, maps, I can't look at it, I don't know what a map is, you know, mm-hmm. um, I'm very clumsy, but, but I think, again, I have this heightened, heightened relationship to language, right. I, like a, I have a synesthetic relationship to language, I see the word and I see what it is, like surprise looks like a surprise, you know, mm-hmm. like it has surprise energy. So I don't even have to like look, it just looks like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I feel like part of what I can do as a poet is arrange those those word images. Um, and so I was always drawn to very image driven poetry. Yeah, so you think as a reader and as an editor, you're kind of drawn to words or to writings that create those pictures for you? I like density. Okay. Yeah, I like density. I mean, I like head- I like a certain level of headiness, but um, I, I also think it's important. Um, I'm a human being. I'm very aware of my humanity. Um, and my humanity does not reside in my intellect, it resides in my body. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I think I am most drawn to lyric poetry, because I think lyric bo- poetry's most sincere source is the body. Um, although I think there are, there are different ways to navigate and think about the body and, and write about it. But again, I think also growing up Latina there's a lot of thinking about your body. Mm-hmm. There are assumptions that are made about your body because I was tomboyish, and I was very tomboyish. I mean, I, I, I you know, at a certain point, I rejected um, <clears throat> femininity. I dressed like a boy, um, which drove, you can imagine, <laughs> it drove my family yeah. crazy. Um, but I just, I, and I know that part of it was a kind of discomfort with, um, maybe sexualization, mm-hmm. um, and that's just Catholic. <laughs> that's just a Catholic thing, I think. But um, I kind of lost my train of thought there. So, okay, um, <laughs> <laughs> we can refocus. Okay. <laughs> so you talk a little bit about how milk and filth is kind of an ode to um, second wave feminism, specifically. How do you think that your writing has evolved as feminism has evolved, and what do you think about our current evolution of feminism? Um, I think my, I think I wanted to write, um, well, I wanted to write an like an angry feminist book. Mm-hmm. I felt like that had hadn't been well. Interestingly enough, I taught um, a Kate Marvin book in my class, 
and one of this male student said, I don't want to read a book by an angry feminist. And I was like, you think this is a book by, I mean, like, really? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. this is a really powerful book, but you don't, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Like, and so I realized, I was sort of looking around and the, the picture at the time was um, this kind of, I guess I just didn't see what I found sexy about, you know, 70s and 80s feminism is like that hardcore, um, I don't know what it, I, just hardcoreness. Right. Just like, um, kind of like an attitude. An attitude, and I guess the other part of it maybe was um, I, f I felt like um, we hadn't quite resolved this, the objectification question, I think, and I think we've actually really devolved. In, the, in that respect, like when you think of, you know, a, I recently saw a cover of Sports Illustrated magazine, you know, with this woman, and it was like, it looked like child pornography. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, and um, and I'm not a prude by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but, um, and that, this idea of like reclaiming femininity and like, well, we, you know, femininity hasn't gone anywhere. And I, and I just remembered the experience of reading No More Masks and reading Adrian Rich and um, June Jordan and Audre Lorde and um, Alice Walker and um, I, a lot of women of color. And I, and I think that's part of the reason too that I wasn't seeing women of color being represented, mm -hmm. represented in these types of feminisms that were being portrayed in, in, the, um, in the mid 90s. Um, early aughts. So um, I, I originally said my idea of Milk and Filth was it was a tribute album to No More Masks, which mm -hmm. was such a formative book for me. So, like if I think of poems, I can think of specific poems in No More Masks that, ha that resonate and echo in, um, in all of my books. And so I wanted to pay tribute to and also analyze what it was about that discourse that was more attractive to me than what I saw the direction of third wave feminism going into. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, I think when I talk to um, friends, uh, other friends of mine like De Paredes, who's an amazing scholar and poet, we talk about how um, our sense of like the transition between second and third wave was like, whoa, 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 we didn't you guys didn't resolve the race thing, mm -hmm. right? Like that you guys are good and you know, you're know you lawyers and you're making more money and all of that, but you know, we're, we're still in this, almost in the same exact place that we were in the 70s. Um, and so we don't have time to reclaim our frilliness and our bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, we have work to do. Mm -hmm. Like equality for women means equality for all, all women. women. Um, and so with that energy, I was looking at No More Masks, I was thinking about the tropes of second wave feminism, which were a lot of persona poems, which were that sort of declarative manifesto, mm -hmm. um, very much about the body. I remember one of the poems that I absolutely loved in No More Masks was about this woman having her period. Um, and in fact, the poem Bleeding Heart is, is influenced um, by this poem. And she like is, she's like, I'm, you know, she's just bleeding all over the place, you know, like on this. And it just was like, what? <laughs> you know, I remember when I was like 21, like, oh my God, she's having her period in public. But um, it was just that really aggressive uh, um, use of reminding, um, reminding a reader, reminding the world that the female body is like effulgent mm -hmm. and you know it was not just this compact space to penetrate and exploit but like produced and what you know historically had been the center uh, you know had been worshiped mm -hmm. and and um, you know migration patterns and territorial patterns changed the way that we thought about the female body um, and so i just really went after that but Again, my mom, funny. I tried to. I tried to be funny because I think that that's. I can't not be funny. Right, and it's just like a self-defense almost, right? To yeah. undercut your own anger by being like, almost 
doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, you know, you get so angry and then you're le- you're spent and all you can kind of do is laugh at yourself. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that rhetorically humor is disarming and humor is also um, is dangerous because um, humor, like people, like if you think, oh, that's a really funny novel, you would never say that's a really funny, serious novel, mm-hmm. right? Um, but there are a lot of really funny, uh, you know, serious novels and a lot of really funny, serious um, books of poetry. And so, again, that was another type of transgression that I wanted to play with was h- humor. Um, so epigrams for a lady is, uh, you know, I just took a bunch of Nietzsche and then I just changed it into like, you know, if Nietzsche was, you know, like a, a ladies magazine <laughs> writer, <laughs> you know, what would he, what would she say? Frederica Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> Taking it all out. Yeah, and I think a lot of the humor is, like, very biting as well, yeah. right? So yeah. you're just, like, almost in a way that it's, you feel like it's a voice that's almost under its breath the whole time, but yeah. it's finally saying it out loud. Yeah. Like, we're getting the speaker who his whole life has been kind of listening to what academia and patriarchal, like, institutions and just, like, the hegemonic community talking and, like, as a child, we're kind of say comments to herself. And now yeah. she's finally getting some space. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, and everybody should hear it, not just herself. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's, I mean, I would, I did not, I did not know... I, when I was writing this book, I mean, I, you know, I have each book, I have a different, like, it's, they're like children, you have a different relationship with them. I was like, this book is crazy. And I actually, when I sent it to Arizona, I was like, there's no way that they're going to take this. So, it, it, you know, because it was just kind of su- such an intense book. Um, and um, they loved it. And they were excited by it. And, um, and so when it came out, and like people, their response to it was really, I mean, obviously it was thrilling because, you know, uh, you know, nobody, nobody had, I hadn't had many people talk about my work before, but people were like, oh, you know, thank you. I needed to hear this. I felt liberated by it. And, and I was, that was, that was, I think probably the best feeling I've ever had in my life because that's what I was trying to replicate from my experience of I was just trying again a tribute album to no more masks I was just trying to resurrect these tropes these approaches because they were useful and they Mm -hmm. were important and to disavow them um, you know based on some idea that that we've experienced some kind of you know invisible advancement um, we haven't Right. I mean, like, I think people will say things like, you know, I don't like it when women talk about their periods because we get it. You have periods. Like, we've already gotten that. We, re- we saw the vagina man- monologue, <laughs> monologues. And I'm like, well, if you're so uncomfortable with it, then, like, if we've said it so much, then why are you still feeling, like, yeah. s- like so uncomfortable? I'm going to say it until you're comfortable. Like, exactly. In my intro to gender class, yeah. um, when I speak sometimes about, like, orgasms, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to say orgasm at you <laughs> until you're comfortable with the fact that your professor is saying orgasm at right. it. Yeah. And I think that as a society, we haven't had enough women, like, voices permeate. Like, we have so many wonderful vo- women voices, but we have to continue the permeation yeah, through Yeah, absolutely. Because the message is so mixed because... Women's, bo- I mean, women's bodies are, you can see, you know, almost naked women. And I'm not, a, again, I think women's bodies are awesome and beautiful, mm-hmm. and I can look at them all day long. Um, but the way that they're used commercially um, has really tra- changed the way um, they're seen generally. Mm-hmm. I'd be, I mean, I would be interested in, like, imagining, like, Roland Bart thinking about the cover of Maxim magazine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Just bringing the mythos in. Yeah, it. exactly. Yes. And thinking about like um, how how does a person, a young man look at Maxim magazine and then look at you know, a, my yeah. daughter yeah. or someone's daughter and not have similar expectations like it's it doesn't make sense. And I'm again, I'm not I'm not a prude and I'm not I'm you know, I, I think sex is awesome, and I think being sexy is amazing. But I think that part of what hasn't happened is a level playing ground. That mm-hmm. at the end of the day, women always pay a price for their sexuality. Absolutely. Um, that men don't necessarily have to pay. Right. I mean, like, and also the medium in which they can approach sexuality. 
Yeah. People are fine reading Kathy Acker and talking about Don Quixote and like that woman as an, an appropriation of something, but they don't necessarily want to hear like Nicki Minaj taking charge of her body and right. saying this is my sexuality. Right. So um, just like who gets especially to be, someone like Nicki Minaj, a right. woman of color, a woman of color, um, a woman at the top of her field. There's just so many uh, layers to still say what we can and can't do for people to kind of come at us and be like, but we've already heard it. Yeah. It's like, you may have heard it, but are you listening? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not just about hearing it. It's about it's about creating an ethos mm -hmm. in, in which women are equal. Right, and not just the kind of idea that women are equal. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of having, hoping to have you read just a little bit of autobiography, parts of autobiography, uh, not the whole thing, obviously, okay. <laughs> but maybe 24 through um, 54. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to read the numbers. You, yes. You heard okay. why. Okay. <clears throat> I saw power and its limited scope, and I wanted it. This want created a monster, a feminist. I'm a feminist for all the bodies strewn over history and semi-emerging from the earth. There are deserted bodies and ruined bodies and starved bodies all around me. My mother's body once was sharp, now it's delusional and rotten with dementia. My baby sister killed her body and other girls have destroyed their bodies since then. I write angry that these women had little agency in this world and that they are not in books. This anger requires that I adapt the tenets of my feminist aspiration, saving the world for decaying female bodies, for example. What I will do with power might terrify. Anyone can enter my work because it's about viscera and I've got wounds into it and they're little windows into the workings of me. The reveal, the abject pleasure of this abject mind. I write a poem in which I reveal my true feelings. The body is the engine and the brain is the hindrance. I silence the brain with language play. I also break down the sentence, accommodate my ample ass in it, neutralize the modification with it. To write a poem, I mustn't be wearing a bra. I'm debased, but not that low. I'm just more animal than machine, more heart than head. I'm a worm with bones and a sophisticated sensing organ. I'm guts in a vice. Scars are radical exposition. I'm provoked by the way scars encroach the body. I'm working on a catalog of my scars. Confessional implies shame, whereas a scar is the trace of violence, and it's always connected to a narrative about the body and is more than confession, perhaps emblem. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Of course. Um, so we talked a little bit about, just you and I, about this poem as a guide for the book and something that kind of grounds it. But uh, it's also a very vulnerable. It's the heart in so many different ways. It's the heart because it, it pumps into the other poems, but it's also the heart because it's one of the most vulnerable positions in the book. Um, last night, one of my students approached you and told you how much both reading that poem and writing her own poem kind of opened her up. Do you find that that happens to you a lot? Because it's such a vulnerable poem. I would think that many people are very touched by the idea of being open themselves, not just seen into you, but seen into themselves through that poem. Um, I, I mean, I hope so. I, that was the challenge. I mean, I, the um, it really, I, kept, I mean, it was this constant challenge of what is the most vulnerable, what is the most honest thing I can say. Um, and, and I also left it, so, like, it, I, there were 111 in there, and I, and I always thought, well, you know, I could pick it up again because there's a lot more that I could say. Um, but, it, but I also felt like I was creating an Ars Poetica in a way. And, and at the center of the Ars Poetica is that, um, is that my body is vulnerable, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, um, and, and the, that vulnerability has created different kinds of energies and issues in my life some of them um, unshakable, um, some of them transformative. 
And I don't know, for me personally, thinking about that and honoring that I am the person who I am in this moment because of the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, and survived, I guess, survive, you know, having survived um, is means that those things were important and there's nothing to be afraid of in our story. I also think, though, that another part of, of that was my interest and my, my homage to the idea of what the confessional was. Mm -hmm. Because confessional poetry, I think because of who, again, Alan Soldovsky, my teacher, who, who was, you know, um, very, that was, he was very well versed in that, um, that world and introduced me to it and I really fell in love with it. I felt that part of, um, and there's a, I told you about that book, Lyric Shame, that mm -hmm. talks about the different reasons that lyric poetry. I thought that part of the reason that confessional poetry started getting a bad rap was that because women were starting to t speak truths. Mm -hmm. And um, although, like many of the major practitioners, Snodgrass, Lowell, you know, um, were male, like the, the enduring confessional poets are always. Um, Anne Sexton, Sylvia mm -hmm. Plath, etc., mm -hmm. um, and and I and I thought like that that I mean like reading Anne Sexton first of all normalized mental illness for me, right. which was very very important. Um, being a person who's mentally ill um, and having someone again be mentally ill and be successful mm -hmm. and not be afraid of 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 her illness and understand how it works. That was, you know, like that was that was important for me. That was transformative for me, and so like logically, it would make sense that if that's what Anne Sexton and Sylvia Plath can do, were able to do for me, um, it's possible that my work can do that. Um, and I had no interest. I mean, I tried the ironic, ironic distance. I like surrealism. I think that surrealism is always a little bit of an undercurrent in my work. But I just can't be a detached person. I can't, um, I can't not really, not just feel, I can't not really feel heavily in my work. Um, you know, I don't, I don't remember what musician it is. He's a jazz pianist. But <clears throat> when you hear him playing, you can hear him humming while he's playing. Oh, wow. And it's so beautiful. Um, and my, my husband pointed this out to me. And like that's because his body is connected to, like he can't not engage with the music. His body is connected to it. And that's kind of how I feel like when I'm writing a poem, if, not, if I'm not like putting myself in it in like this really, um, like I try to say, things, I try to find the starkest, most accurate way of saying things, and it involves a lot of mining, and um, when I, and I mean, I guess I think of, I, I, I think Keats's negative capability is used a lot as an intellectual exercise, mm -hmm. but I use it as an emotional exercise. I tell, when I talk about negative capability, I tell my students that part of what they need to do is to go into the darkness that they reach a certain point in a poem and that's when they stop, but that's actually the beginning of the exploration because they don't know what's ahead of them. And that's exactly what their reader needs to discover. And in fact, that's what they need to discover. You know, catharsis is part of mm -hmm. poetry. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess that's always been my ethos in relation to poetry and there have been times that that hasn't been popular, but it's still my ethos. So you talk a little, a lot about mentorship, both your own mentorship and the mentorship that you do. Um, and I know on the Vita Roundtable, you discussed how it is both exciting and kind of also a burden a little bit to have to be a woman of color because you are often the representative for other women of color. Um, can you talk a little bit about what draws you to, to being a mentor and both the struggles and the, and the exciting parts of it? Well, I get to meet amazing Thank people. <laughs> um, I was mentored, and it, you know, it got me where I am. And um, and I have my friends like uh, uh, Roberto Tejada. I'll never forget. He helped me through some work stuff, and I just he, he was on vacation, and like texting me and calling me and checking in with me, and I was just so grateful. And he's like, I'm just paying it forward. 
and you know like I and and I think that's a big part of it I think the other piece of why even though it's you know even though it's challenging and it's like oh yeah what a complaint you have to do readings all the time and you know people want you to do these things um, I don't mind doing them and I and, and I say yes and I'm kind of a workaholic my my mom was a work like a real workaholic mm -hmm. and I'm you know in the vicinity <laughs> um, uh, I think that my ethos as a poet is also connected to the literary community I think I because of my work at such an early age with Alan doing the Center for Literary Arts you know trying to attract readers trying to create audiences for different kinds of poets I just realized that that was a, like that was part of it that you if you were a writer it wasn't just about you putting work in the world it was you also because it, this world is not, is less and less interested mm -hmm. in literature every day um, even though it's very important and and does important work and I guess ev you know there's evidence long historical evidence that books have had a lot of influence in the world and they will continue to do so. Um, we just have to remind people of that. Um, I've been very lucky. I'm a, prof I'm a professor. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to San Jose State. I barely graduated. And now I'm like an associate professor. And um, that happened because people believed in me even when um, I was doing a terrible job. <laughs> I remember when I was in high school, I um, I was in an English class, like it was a regular English class, and I was just bored to death. I was, and I and I went to the teacher and I said, I think you're a great teacher, but um, I think I need to be in a higher level class. <laughs> and she was like, What? And I was like, Yeah, I think you know. And so she's like, Okay, well, you have to talk to these teachers. And so I went and I talked to the teachers and, you know, again, talk about being a hustler. I got into the higher level mm -hmm. class. I never got higher than like a C or a B minus, but they just saw that I was, you know, I was passionate and they just kept giving me teaching and love and support, um, despite the fact that I cut class all the time and, mm -hmm. you know, made bad choices or whatever. Um, and that's that's why I'm here um, so I can't imagine living my life um, and not doing that same work but I also I think um, I I'm like as in all of the things I do my favorite thing is collaboration I love mm -hmm. collaborating with people and I think mentorship is a type of collaboration but you know um, I'm not like um, I'm not a gentle mentor <laughs> you know like I mean I think uh, when I think of people um, I, I guess it's also just this the reality of like how difficult being a poet being a writer being all of these things um, I once told my students in class you know how in dance classes there are those teachers who have those sticks yeah <laughs> and they, like, I don't know what they are maybe rulers yeah maybe? I don't know <laughs> it, well they're for the rhythm oh like, okay right right, right. and um, I told my class one day you know I want you know I think I want one of those sticks so I can and so they uh, uh, my student Sarah actually she brought me like a little like a little wand that I could <laughs> you know stamp on my um, stamp on my desk that's just I guess that's just who I am and I can't you know I um, but um, I do I love it I'm so my greatest prides are not my books but are the successes of the people that I've had the great honor and pleasure to work with um, the, the fact that my you know that some of my students have gone on and had successful careers that's what gives me the greatest joy like I'm excited and I love having a book but the the ability the, the fact that I had this honor to work with this person and this person took not just what I did, but what a lot of different people did and turned it into something for themselves. Mm -hmm. What could be better than that? Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and thank you to the Institute of Latino Studies. Thank you. Thank you.